Welcome to the Buker and Friends podcast, co-starring 10-year NBA center Ryan Hollins. Triple pump fakes, leads it, shot blocked by Ryan Hollins. Hollins sent that into the third row. Six rebounds and eight assists. Oh! Hollins climbs the stairs. Down the floor. Ryan oh! Hollins, he is the high jumper. That's what I want to see. Give me some gunpowder and throw the hammer down. And now, here is your host. Let's send it over to Rick Buker. Rick Buker. Welcome to another edition of Buker and Holland, subsidiary of Buker and Friends, part of the United WeCast Network. I'm Rick Buker. You can see me on FS1. You can read me on Bleacher Report. And you can follow me on Twitter at Rick Buker. He is Ryan Hollins. You can see him on ESPN, TNT, NBA TV. He's everywhere. And you can follow him on Twitter at the Ryan Hollins and on Instagram at simply Ryan Hollins. All right. It's been a been a minute since you and I have been able to get together and a lot has transpired uh, when it comes to the playoffs. The first the first question I have for you is Watching the Eastern Conference, we've had two games in each series, and they have been lopsided both ways. They've been blowouts. Can you explain to me why those those matchups or why we've seen it go the way that it has? Well, Rick, for one, I haven't even gotten to the point of the gameplay, but as an outlook... Hmm. This is the greatest second round of the NBA playoffs that we have ever seen. You Top think so? Top to bottom, the greatest second round of the NBA playoffs that we've we've ever, ever seen. And, and I hope we just get seven-game series just uh, across the board. Seven game after seven game after seven game, bro. Now, that's based on what? What makes you feel that way? Because I going in, I had hoped for that. Some of the play has not been that great and because we've had blowouts because we've had these games that have swung so dramatically one way or the other it hasn't been as drama filled as i had hoped it would be no no no. you're right the drama hasn't been there but as far as the star power we got the eastern conference semifinal we've been begging for Mm -hmm. and and boston had us a little worried bro but we we got the the eastern conference semifinal we've been begging for boston toronto milwaukee and uh, and it, who am I? Who was a I mean, Philly? Oh, yeah, Boston, Philly come Boston Milwaukee, and, and Toronto. Uh, now listen, Philly. Yeah, in the West, the team that definitely disappointed. There's a whole side of the bracket with zero star power since Russell Westbrook and those guys couldn't share the basketball and yeah. and defend and do the little things. They they grossly disappointed. But but we got the performance of a lifetime from Damian Lillard. So I, I he. he Lillard's kind of made himself a name where I kind of like I want to like for real like I want to watch what he's gonna do next like yeah. he's he's really intrigued and I I haven't felt that way about him before Rick I don't know if I'm late to the party but I just hadn't felt that way like yo what's he gonna do in the playoffs wow last second shot give him the ball make it happen Damien has grown on me but Damien has grown period when they got blitzed by the New Orleans Pelicans and they lost to basically just a big backcourt in Drew Holiday and Rajon Rondo. To me, that that was why they were upset, is because those two were able to shut down CJ and Damian, and the battle between Nurkic and AD was not a battle. AD got the better part, part of that, and so the, the Blazers' strength simply wasn't there, and I think that's where uh, Damian extending his range began. Because if mm. you're gonna if I'm gonna get matched up against big guys like he was against Paul George at the end, you're not gonna come all the way out to 37 feet. If you come out to 35, 35 feet, now I'm gonna go by you. So you got to give me room to get this off. I I, I honestly believe that the, the losing the series the way they did is he was looking for an antidote for that and he found it. So I don't know that you're late to the party. I believe that Damian has just step by step has grown and. So we're seeing it, and this is what kind of amazes me. Um, The guys on inside the NBA, not that Kenny and Charles and Shaq are always on point, but I I, I respect Kenny a lot. I think Kenny really puts the time in to know what he's talking about. You don't respect Charles? 
Charles still, I, I like Charles. I like Charles and I like to watch Charles and I like to listen to Charles. Do I think that Charles is fully in tune with the game today? I think he still references everything based on what happened in his day. And it's fun, but I don't know that it's necessarily accurate. Right? <laughs> I'm just laughing, man. You're crazy. You're just, well, you're not crazy, but you're you're honest that I'm I'm just tickled by that. So No, seriously, like when I'm at the TNT studios, yeah. Like like bro, behind the scenes, like the like they're on air and they're off air is the same banter, just just yes. minus minus some language, obviously. Yes. But it's bro, it's the same, like it's gen like those dudes are genuine, like yeah. Yeah, no, and I love it. And I mean, it's 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 a great show, and I I love talking to Charles. But like, if I'm looking for someone to give me insightful analysis, I'm going to Kenny. I'm not going to Chuck. If I want to be entertained, I'm going to Chuck. So, all that said, those guys are are talking about the Blazers coming out of the West, which. I'm just, I don't want to say no because it's a great story, but I have a hard time. Excuse me, out of the West or just to the conference finals? No, out of the West. They see them going to the finals. Who said that? The, no, they've, they've said that. They've, and I think they are. I, I they heard are maybe to the conference finals. They, they are on the Blazers. <laughs> Maybe to the conference finals. I, I didn't hear beating Golden State. No, I, I heard they're oh, going gosh, to the finals. Stop. So, <laughs> stop. Stop. Stop it. But here's the thing. It's funny watching. What I, I've been with the Warriors. I was with the Warriors down for game six against the Clippers. I was at games one and two uh, against the Rockets. In the last game, Steph Curry takes yet another injury dislocates the middle finger on his his left hand. I uh, love the way he came out. He was like, I'm going to show you this is not going to affect my shot. And it, and it kind of did. <laughs> but my bigger question is it affecting his handle because he needs to be able, you know, he's got that seesaw. He needs to be able to handle with his left as well as his right. And, but this is the, this is, these these nicks and dings, this is exactly what I expected. The Clippers taking them a couple more games than than they expected that it would take for them to get through that round. I don't think this is going to be a short series, even though the Warriors are up 2-0. And I just feel as if by the time they get to the finals, and yes, I still have them getting to the finals, that Steve Kerr will have had to ride his main horses so much to get there. That they are going to be, they're gonna they're gonna be sitting ducks when it comes to facing Toronto or or the Celtics. You don't so whoa, 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 Rick, so in some magic way, Toronto's not gonna get beat up. Boston's not gonna get beat up. Like I think they have uh, the. I think they have <laughs> one. One they have the depth, and two, I don't expect that like for. All that the Warriors have been through through the last four or five years. And the short... I mean, they... Look, Steve's having to start either Andre Iguodala or Sean Livingston. One of those two guys is starting every game now. When he goes to his bench, beyond the guy who's not starting, who's there that you look at and say, okay, I know I can count on I'm going to get X, Y, or Z from... No offense, but... Jonas Durepko, Alfonso McKinney. It, it's what are you getting? And so he's having to ride his horses hard. And whatever KD is on right now is really making a huge difference. But I just, they're compromised. Clay's playing on a bad ankle. Steph's playing on a bad ankle. Now he has a bad finger. And I would expect your the chances are you're going to see somebody else get nicked or dinged along the way and they they just can't afford it their margin of error is thinner than it's ever been so rick i hear you on age i i hear you on that and i, I do agree that this is going to be their hardest championship ever the, the hardest one they've ever got but i don't think that they don't get it 
And if you want to look at an element here of Steph Curry, if I'm Steph Curry, would I rather come off a a busted ankle or a, or a busted knee or whatever, hmm. or just really miss it real time, or would I rather have a broken finger? Oh, the finger without question. Well, Especially I, if it's on your non-shooter. Right, exactly. So, I, hey, I tell you one thing. Steph is looking at this finger thing, and he's like, oh, my God. Like, thank you. This is it? Thank you. Well, thank well, you. Hopefully this Hopefully this is it. But you. But you also, we also know that with Steph, like Steph utilizes everything that he's got. He utilizes his handle to create his shot. He utilizes his ambidexterity. He's finishing with either hand and so when you start to take a few of these things away when you start to limit just a little bit what he does in the scope of who the Warriors are I mean I'm not trying to be chicken little I've been saying this all year but as I watch them get nicked and dinged along the way and taking a couple extra games to get past the Clippers this is exactly what I thought the recipe would be for them to get knocked off when they have their five out there their ability to lock down, the way their offense runs, it's still better than anybody else's. There's no question about that. That the value of their experience and their understanding of each other is greater than it's ever been before. But can they last through what? Another what do they need? Another 10 wins? And you, how many games know does it take yeah, them to but get here those still, 10 Rick. wins? This is what's tough with the Warriors, and I saw this in the Clippers series, and I, I feel like a lot of people aren't giving the Clippers the, the, their just due, their credit. It was, ah, well, it, it was more so Golden State's lost it, and like, you know, okay, the Clippers are this scrappy group. Yeah. The Clippers pushed the Warriors, bro. And the one thing that I saw that I actually really respect, and maybe I, I overlooked it from the Warriors, and I, I know you're overlooking hmm. – they they will win different styles of games, and Kerr just gets bullheaded in certain moments. It's that kind of like I don't know if he wants to humble his team or whatever, but sometimes he won't make adjustments purposely and be like, "Well, I just think we're just good enough. We're just good enough." And then he'll get down and be like, "Nah, I really got to coach. We give, really have to make adjustments." Give me an example. Give me an example. Okay, so for instance. The thought process was in game two, in game one, we have Patrick Beverly on Kevin Durant. Mm. So we're going to run our regular offense. Mm -hmm. And but we're going to run him off pin downs. And when we run him off a pin down, it's a way to get Patrick Beverly off of him. Now, Patrick Beverly now gets off Kevin Durant. Kevin Durant hits some shots. They come out with the same damn game plan the very next game. And now Patrick Beverly top blocks Kevin Durant, right. and Kevin Durant's in a, in a bad way. Then in game three, it was like, hold on, we need to find a way to get Kevin shots. And now he puts Kevin in situations where he can catch, take one dribble, and go up and raise right. up and score. And that was an adjustment, the floor being spread, getting Kevin in some movement scenarios, uh, putting Clay Thompson in certain coverage, actually changing his lineup. He didn't change the lineup until game six. I think Jermichael Green started two games before that lineup was actually changed, mm -hmm. and Livingston was in, inserted in. And that that was a big factor. That was a big factor. And then, uh, and then in, in last, I'll say, what impresses me now also is that, and I didn't hear this last year, Kevin Durant grew up in last year's playoffs because there are moments where I don't want to say he was bad, but he wasn't a warrior. And now he's grew up to where Rick, and I'm sure you've seen this, he's accepting – there is some truth in his Kevin Durant, I'm Kevin Durant rant, yeah. where he was like, the ball's going to find me in the offense. Yes. And he didn't have that faith before against Houston, and it darn near cost them the series, and he finally started believing. Yeah. No, I, I also believe he has accepted it. I don't know that he loves it. <laughs> From, I mean, if you're looking for one more reason why he would leave the Warrior situation, it's because there's nothing that he enjoys more than putting the ball in the basket. This is from people that have known him since he came into the league. Like, that is the thing that he enjoys. And you can see, based on what he has done on this run, why that is. And I, I 
for my money, giving him the ball in situations where it's only one or two dribbles to get into a shot is the ideal thing to do. I really don't like him, and I think we've seen it in these first two games. When you give him the ball up top, it's not always ideal, especially when he's playing against a smaller defender. No. The dribble gets exposed, and he he's... I don't, I'd, I'd love to see the, the, the metrics on the success rate. I feel like he's bought in, though, Rick. I, I think part of me said, dang, that was kind of – because I didn't – for real talk, I didn't I didn't buy into it at first. But after the way I've seen him play, I was kind of like, yo, I, I think he bought in. Well, no, 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 no. He's, he's, he's bought in as far as this is the way we play and I'm going to go along with it. I don't know don't what, ideally that it. that's what he wants to do the rest of his career. Mm. I, so, I, I think I think Kevin Durant listening to the media is the reason. I think him personally, I don't think he would have a problem with it. I think he's actually letting the media get to him. Hmm. And I don't mind Kevin Durant striving for more, but I it does bother me that I feel like there's an element of every going, it's not fair, it's not fair. I don't respect KD, I don't respect and that's the way he's gonna say, Well then I'm leaving then. You know, I'm gonna go. Right. So, do you? What do you expect from this series moving forward? Oh man, this this might be this could be ugly, bro. I mean, there's there's an honest potential that Houston goes out in five. Wow. I, 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 it looks like they're going to go out in five. They just the one thing Chris Paul did really well last year is beat his individual matchups. Yeah. And he scored really well off the bounce. He's improved as a as a three point shooter off the bounce, which when I played with him wasn't really in his game like that. Yeah, uh, he was good finishing at the rim or being crafty. And Chris really lost a step, and that's bothered him in scenarios. Th- they don't look like the same dogs going after. Golden they do State. not. They they have not played that way. I ran into Daryl Morey right right after the game, and he was like, "We got our asses kicked." And and by the score and by opportunity, I would I would contest that because I felt like they were just a couple shots away. There were opportunities in both of those games where they had shots where they really could have put the pressure on the Warriors, and they missed those shots. And those were shot those shots came from Harden and Chris Paul. They came from their best their best guys. PJ Tucker in Game One had wide open and they had wide open shots. They've had opportunities to score much better than they have even though their their offense has not looked uh very smooth but all that said they haven't played with the energy of somebody trying to knock off the champions i feel, I feel like golden state outworked them it's funny you yes. say that and 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 there's also elements and i've gone you know in, you know been privileged to move on in some playoff series and there are certain series that test you and get you better, and you go, dang, I need to rebound. Dang, I need to do this. And you start, you know, as a team, you check off all the boxes. I, I, I need to rebound. I need to get 50-50 balls. We got to play hard. We got to make shots. We, got, we, have to re, we do have to do all these things to win. We got to defend. Yeah. And then you go on to the next series, and you blast your opponent who was not held with the same accountability. Utah didn't prepare Houston for Golden State the way that the Clippers prepared yeah. Golden State yeah. for Houston. That's a good call. That's and a that's really good real. call. Because the Clippers are far closer to Houston than Utah is to Golden State in terms yes. of just the way they play and what their strengths and weaknesses are. And Utah is so traditional that they don't put you in bad situations defensively the way the Clippers do, the way Golden State does. So... Houston's almost like they're taken back. Like you know, they, it's 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 not the same. I, you, I'll you know what? Dang, I, I, five, yeah, in five, bro. I'd see Golden State in five. I can't argue with that. I want to see more. And obviously, from my argument, when it comes to that, you know, along the way, that all these teams are going to take a piece out of them. I do know this. I know the Rockets can play far better than they have in the first two games, without question. Now, whether they find some of that, and to your point, when when it, with with Chris Paul, yeah, there's Chris Paul has had opportunities to attack off the bounce, and he has relied more on his three point shot than he ever has. For whatever reason, he's it almost it almost looks like he's afraid to extend himself and 
blow a hamstring again the way he did last year. That's what it looks like. It looks like a guy who who's playing cautious from a physical standpoint. I do want to ask you one thing. This just popped in my head seeing Jamal Charles, the running back, go back and sign a one day uh, one day contract with the Kansas City Chiefs so he could retire as a chief. And I was thinking about I was thinking about you and if you were going to if you were going to be remembered in one uniform what would it what, what what's the uniform that you would want to be remembered in clipper you have to be a clipper um and obviously like it's cool working for their broadcast it's cool playing at home in LA uh it was a sexy team to play for i had more success uh, in Boston. Yeah. Uh, I was I thought a bigger you might piece. Say Boston. I was the bigger piece of the team in Dallas. I actually had a game that yeah. won the series. We were the series was one one or kind of two one, and we go up three one and knock the Spurs out the playoffs. Bigger performance. Um, but I'd like to be remembered as a Clipper if I had a retirement because it was the first time I got to play in front of my father. Um as a professional and at home and to where he didn't have to travel. He didn't have to fly to games. Uh, he didn't have to see me once or twice a year when we played the Lakers and the Clippers or even, you know, maybe four times or sparingly. Um, I got to play in front of my old man huh. and that meant something. And when I was a Clipper, there, it was just, there was just something different, man. And I remember I, I can honestly say, with a clear conscience, I gave the Clippers 110%. There was nothing left on the floor. There's nothing that I want back. Now, I wish I was treated better, treated different. I wish I had more of a role. I wish I was a little more selfish, you know, so to speak. But I, In what way? I was the ultimate team guy. The ultimate team guy is someone you move on from. He's not a core of your team. Right. You know, I, I would sacrifice my shots because I want to make the team play. I want to set the good screen. I want to grab the rebound. It went like, nah, Ryan, make sure you take an open three-pointer. Nah, Ryan, if you got the ball, go to the hole and score. Nah, Ryan, demand the basketball. It was like, do what I need to do to help the team win. Play your role. Okay, but how do you do you think that being selfish would have benefited you? Yeah, I probably would still be on the team or a much more lucrative situation if I had just because you know, of your been, numbers, even yeah, absolutely. My analytics are horrible. The best analytic for me was a plus minus, where I'm on the floor, the team plays better. Hmm. You know, they don't have analytics for guys who set good screens and in guys who hey, when he's on the floor, Jamal Crawford gets ten more shots a game. He gets more open. He shoots a better percentage. Yeah. Or hey, you know, he runs the floor and the pace of the game changes. Those analytics uh, aren't what people look for. Or, hey, he boxed out, so Matt Barnes gets the rebound. Well, Matt Barnes averages five, seven rebounds a game. He, Ryan only averages five. Well, Ryan boxes out, so Matt can get the rebound. You know what I'm saying? Mm. So selfish in that sense because it is a business. It, it is a numbers game. Yeah. I, 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 I was not appreciated for those things. And, you know, I challenge any NBA player right now to make sure he's selfish. Make sure you give coach what he wants. But you go and get what you need in order to stay in the league. Because all that, I, I assure you right now, every coach, darn near 90, but I want to almost want to say darn near every coach has lied to me. Because they always told you defense gets you on the floor and keeps you on the floor. Nah, buddy, offense does. Yeah. You got to be good on defense, but you got to be great on offense. If you're <laughs> a bucket, you're going to be on the floor. Interesting. So it really, in spite of all of that, the chance to play in front of your dad was the thing that made playing for the Clippers special. Am I am I yeah. portraying that correctly? Yeah. It was it was special. And what and and so what's that like in a big arena and you know your dad's there? Like that because it's it's different. Like high school, college, whatever. It's a smaller crowd. You know where everybody is, right? You can see him, and and you probably could see your dad and and all that. But it's a much bigger, bigger stage. What was what was different about 
playing with him there on, I would say, most nights, right? Or at, compared to when he would only see you once or twice a year? Well, I don't care who you are. It, for any young man, um, and I'll say, you know, even throw young women in there too, but maybe even more instrumental for young men, there's this, there's this desire to make your father proud. Hmm. There's this like, hey, look at me, dad. Like, are you proud of me? Are you happy? Yeah. And as a kid, we literally voice it. Daddy, look at me, look at me, look at me. But he's an, even as a grown man, yeah. you want your old man to look over and smile. Yep. You know, that, that you know what I'm saying? Like, yep. that means something. No. And, and, and I feel like it's bigger, right, Rick? It's bigger than basketball. Yep. And, you know, for some some of you, I'm glad my old man would tell me he was proud of me. But there are some people, and maybe I, I'll shoot a little message to them, man. Even if your old man says he's proud of you or not, man, you're doing a good job in whatever you're doing. You know what's making you proud. But, you know, we all live for that. And it's it's pretty cool when you know that affirmation is there on the other side. Right. That's good stuff. Yeah, no, I, I experienced that both ways. My dad never, I never got compliments from him. He was my coach. Mm. I never got compliments from him, but I, and, but I, I always strive to, like, I wanted the, I, if he said something negative, it killed me. It right? killed you. And yeah, yeah. so, uh, I, with my kids, I'm also sensitive to that because when yeah. they're playing, both yeah. of them are in high school now. And I, they're looking over all the time. Something wow. happens or whatever, and we have those exchanges. And I, yeah. there was a time where, you know, I, I have high expectations for them, and I realized how impactful just my ex, the expression on my face could be. And I yeah. knew that they wanted to do well. And so for me, it became, you know what, I need to be, I need to be encouraging. You know, if I got yeah. a, if I got a disgusted look on my face when they miss a free throw, like that sends a chill through them, right? I yeah. it's like and every once in a while I still catch myself. I'm like hold your follow through or <laughs> you know whatever <laughs> whatever it is, right? But my my uh my kids are terrific and I Did have tried you know? to give them what what you know, what my dad that balance, you know, encourage, don't be over the top. But let did them you know, know the how moments, I feel. Though, Rick, like when you made your dad proud, did you know kind of like, yeah, like, yeah, I know you saw that old man. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You knew, so, you know. So this is a real quick story. We played this because uh, my dad coached me in soccer and um, we played the same team on a weekend. It was like a back-to-back, -back, right? And the Saturday game we lost and... I didn't play very well. And then the next day I was on it. And my dad's way of saying <laughs> that I did a good job in the second game was, you know, the coach came over to me and asked who who, who number 13 was and was, was he even on the team on Saturday, right? <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, okay, that means, <laughs> that means I made an impact on Sunday. So anyway, um, yeah, no, I hear you. I, well, I hear I give, you. I give you this real quick, and Rick, I know I think you touched on this a little bit. My daughter started playing volleyball last year, and I've kind of sworn because my dad did this, this with me. I thank him for this. I'll let them pick up basketball or volleyball or whatever, yeah, if they choose. Yep. And if they say, "Yo, dad." Help me out because I know you were a pro athlete. It's on. Right. But until I hear that, right. I'm going to chill. You know what I'm saying? Like, right. like I'm going to chill. Right. So my daughter was really struggling in volleyball. It was her first time playing. And everything in me wants to go in the backyard, you know, do some drills, get some conditioning, you know, get right. some reps right. up, you know, get some extra practice in. And what bothered me with her wasn't that her skill set wasn't there. It's she was getting really intimidating. And I was it was really hard because I was always coached to yell or scream or come on, let's go. And like mm -hmm. you get motivated. Mm -hmm. And in the car on the way to her game, I just had to express to her, I don't care how good or bad you are, but I care that you have fun 
and I care that you're not scared. Right. That you just go for it. I have a problem if you don't go for it. Right. Now, I don't care if you miss a thousand shots or spikes or what it serves or whatever. I don't care if it goes clear. Out of but as long as you go for it. And she had the game of her life. And I felt like as a parent, that was one of my best moments of like, okay, art- I articulated something. Yes. And I didn't let my my own selfish emotions get in the way and go, now you got to do it like this, this, this. You right. know what I'm saying? Like, right. I didn't mess it up. Right. You know? Yeah. Fathers and daughters is different than fathers and sons. Oh, gosh. And, and I've been through that exact that exact same thing with my daughter and and you know we've uh it's funny because like one of our she had a game where i thought she played scared and i said look i don't care how many shots you miss like you need to believe in yourself as much as your coach and i believe in you Mm. and and you need to let things go because she would make a mistake and she would have such high expectations for herself. You could just tell she would wear it and she made two mistakes in a row. It's like, oh, here we go. And basketball, as you know, man, you now, just is this, can't. Is this, you, because of you, is this because of you being there or is this kind of like she's a perfectionist? I think it's a combination. It's a combination. And so, but I wanted to take my part out of it. But anyway, so... I really, it was, it was a, a drive home and I let her have it. And, and at the, at the end, I, I was like, okay, this is going to go one of two ways. And we got out of the car, we got home, we pulled in the driveway and we got out of the car and she came over and she gave me a hug and she said, thank you for believing in me. And mm. I was like, okay. Cool. <laughs> then it, it, uh, the message got through the the way I wanted it to. Cause I kind of, I ping pong back and forth between look, you're better. This is up on, this is on you. Like you have to take the bull by the horns. And this is why I believe that you can, but this is what's got, this is what's got to happen. And, uh, so yeah, we've, we've we've gone through a lot on that front. All right. I I do want to get to, actually, you know what? I I, want to ask you, has Will Cain apologized to you yet? Absolutely not. His apologies come in like a weird way. So maybe like, maybe when I went on the show, he kind of was like, oh, yeah, you were kind of right. Uh, yeah. It was kind of <laughs> like that. He was like, oh, you're you're gloating. You're tooting your horn now. Like he kind of, I, w- I went on earlier this week and he, that, that, that's kind of like what he said. Okay. So, so for those who don't know, going into the Milwaukee-Boston series, Ryan said what he said all year long, which is, that Giannis is going to struggle in in the postseason, and <laughs> will dismiss that, dismiss the idea that Kyrie Irving was a better closer than Giannis. I mean, said a lot of things that was that were just was crazy talk. It was I feel as almost as if he painted pushed painted himself into a corner, and then he had no choice but to say some things that. There's no way that he actually believed them. There's no way you're actually. In, and then you had uh, uh, Dominique Fox Foxworth. Oh yeah, and then clearly. Oh, I forgot. And then he was like, "So Chris Middleton isn't better than Chris Paul? No. Yeah, right now Chris Middleton is better than Chris Paul. Yeah, yeah. There was, there were, there were oh, a lot so of so much. There's, there's a lot. You're right about that. <laughs> a lot of things said that I anybody who watches basketball would. It was it was will. Just not trying to lose face in the argument at the time, and I'm thinking, yeah, and, and this is and Ryan right, Hollins. You you know and, you do know you're talking to a former NBA player, right? Rick, you are. I swear, I swear, we think so much the same. The first thing I told him on the show is like, and this is his answer. Look, I said, Will, I never want to pull this card. But a lot of things that I say come from thousands and thousands of hours of me studying film and scouting reports. So sometimes I I have opinions. I like it. I don't like it. But there's certain things like like I don't want to just say I know, no, but it's like you can see like this not the way the game is played. And I'm not saying I'm all knowing. 
And then he's like, well, you can you can be wrong sometimes. That was his way of saying, like, you were right. But I was just like, Will, I'm not trying to – I'll say stunt on you. I'm not trying to big time you. But right. I'm like certain things were adamant for them. And, and remember, the very first statement I made, I said everything is going to go through Bledsoe and Middleton for them to have success. Yeah. And what are things going through when those two had success? Yep. yep. Bledsoe and Middleton. Giannis, yep. yeah, he's going to be good, but he's not the guy right now. And right. hopefully he develops into it. I run into the same thing all the time. And I don't want to big time anybody or I don't want to, you know, people come at me in social media or wherever it might be. Uh, and I don't, you know, I don't want to take a, you don't know what you're talking about attitude right yeah i want to have an exchange but there are things that are said that based on covering the league for i mean i just the espn the magazine just um was just shuttered and that was a big stepping stone for me that's how i got to espn and i went back and i looked up the first feature story i ever wrote october 1998 and it was during the lockout with a Reggie Miller and a Mark Jackson and a rookie named Al Harrington and Larry Bird in his second year as the head coach. And it, it just reminded me, like, and I went and saw them. The team was working out during the lockout because Larry had kind of tipped them off. Hey, you, you guys need to be ready because when, when the lockout's over, it's suddenly going to be go time and there's going to be a lot of teams that aren't ready. And if we're ready, we're going to have an advantage. And so I flew to Indy and spent some time with those guys and ESPN the magazine afforded me to do that not only with NBA teams but around the world. Sent me to China, South Africa, Germany, Dang. Serbia. You just you just dated something for me, bro. I forgot ESPN the magazine. Yes. There was ESPN the magazine. I yes. forgot about that. Yes. Dang. So I like I've spent all this time having you know, by by great fortune, having this intimate relationship with the NBA, behind the scenes with people in the NBA, watching things in the NBA. And so there's just this 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 knowledge that you get just from seeing things and seeing how they work. And granted, the game has changed and you do have to stay current with how the game's evolving. Some of the principles, we just talked about Chuck and his view. Like There are principles about the game that do change, and you have to understand that, yeah, 15 years ago, the three-point shot, that wasn't, that, it wasn't, a it good wasn't what it is today. Hey, bro, we used to, true story, we would look at three-point shooters as soft. Yeah. Hey, he's soft. It was like, if you were a shooter, it was like kind of like, oh, he's soft. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Like, we needed a tough guy who could make shots. Right. A, a Mario Ellie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> right? <laughs> yep. Got to be able to hit that shot, but it was really about can you get to the, or Vince Askew. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. No, it's, it's so the, it, it's a combination, but man, there are times where I, I feel like I'm having a conversation with somebody who's start who's watched basketball for like the last five years, and they want to tell me, no, you don't know what you're talking about. And I'm thinking... Dude, I, I don't want to pull a card on you, but I've seen <laughs> I've seen this like I've seen iterations of this nine times over, and you know, somebody wants to throw analytics at me. I'm like the chemistry of a team, understanding how a team works, the bond of a team, the the guys understanding and how they fit together in their roles on the floor, like all of that matters way more than looking at statistics you want to you can you're coming at me with percentages i'm like dude it it doesn't that that doesn't explain how a team works so but no i I credit you rick i mean you know straight up i played in the league 10 years nine different teams 13 different nba coaches and when you talk you know your stuff rick 
Hmm. When, when, when you know we it, it's it's funny we actually have to find stuff to disagree on and sometimes there are really strong disagreements but you, you no you are on point bro I, I would not lie to you or like you know sometimes there's certain and, and this is no disrespect my job is to be a damn analyst okay so let's not get out of rick you're a writer i'm an analyst okay right. and, and sometimes those those paths cross and in, in our instance they cross a lot because we obviously we do this show together but I don't have to stop and explain like, nah, Rick, that's not like you're already on the same page. Like, no, this works because this works and this works or mm-hmm. they won because of that. You get it, Rick. I I will strongly credit you with that. No, I appreciate that. But, I, you know, it's that's simply because I was given the opportunity by people in the league. I, you know, I know I didn't play in the league uh, and but I've competed. So I do I do know how to think like an athlete. And yep. and I'll take that, and then thanks to people explaining hey, we, things would, to me. You would never get a single story if you couldn't, because there's unwritten rules to the game. Yeah. And when you come and talk to a guy, if you don't know those unwritten rules, bro, yep. I'm not trusting you to tell my story, yeah. because you're going to slam me, or you're going to make something that it's not, and yeah. I don't trust you anymore. Yeah. Well, and it's yeah, it's interesting because I just I just went to game two of the Rockets Warriors, and I went with a guy named Doc Shepler, who is a legendary high school coach in the Bay Area. Um, he's taken a a little private school of two hundred. He's taken their girls var- varsity to the Cal Open State Finals two years in a row. They won NorCal both years. They lost in the finals both of those years. He, um, uh, he, he worked with Jeremy Lin. He worked with Patrick McCall. He's a, great, he's a great coach, and he's a great shooting coach in particular. And we were actually having this conversation during the game because he was saying uh, that he was asking me about, you know, why... I was able to kind of have the connection that I have with guys in the league. And, and he thought it was because, and I, and well, I said it was because I think if you, if you don't, if you've never been an athlete or if you've never competed or you've never been in competitive situations, you ask different questions. And the second you ask a question where a guy goes, Oh, that, that's, he doesn't know. Like what this is about, <laughs> yeah. right? You just yep. like it's so wrongheaded that you just you can't get anywhere. And the flip side is, oh, he gets it. He understands what I'm trying to do, or he understands what I'm facing, and you get a completely different buy-in uh, when it comes to that. I, I just did this Blake Griffin piece, and I, I'm I'm sure that a big part of that was me understanding exactly what he was doing in Detroit and how evolved his game was there and that he had the opportunity to do that they gave him the keys and yep. he just he played such a surreal and i know i know this was the the thing that got him to open up is i said you know i'm just i just admire what a cerebral game you're playing and that as i found out that was what he had always wanted to be acknowledged because of the way he's built he's so athletic you know he's a dunker and uh, Shaq and I kind of had the same thing early on. Like I said, I said to him, Zip, like, you know, everybody thinks you just dunk. I go, your game's way, way more evolved than that. And understanding that or seeing that and recognizing that when nobody else is giving you credit for that, that's been, I think, why I've had the chance to get guys to open up and tell me, like, what's really going on. So Blake not- is one of the smartest. He's one of the smartest players I've ever played with. Boy. And if you have a conversation, and, and and I got the chance to find that out because we we had some conversations about some of the like the the inside of the game, like what he's thinking in certain situations and how he's setting guys up. And uh, yeah, it was it's fascinating once you get there because you realize just how much is going on and how much a guy is reading, reacting within the speed and the athleticism and the physicality of the game there's some real mental manipulation going on and i don't you know for our listeners if this turned into a you know wow buker's great kind of soliloquy here 
apologies <laughs> didn't, didn't mean for it to go that way i uh, trust me i'm i'm confident in what i do but i try to remain humble as well i know i don't know everything and and i learn a lot from look there's times where people on twitter or listeners or whatever they do challenge me and they do get me to think about things that maybe i hadn't considered I'm you always, know what disappointed me rick what wasn't just much Will Kane. Will Will disappoints me all the time. <laughs> what, what disappointed me was the way I was harassed. Yeah, the way I was harassed on social media. People, there are some people. YouTubers made a video that said Ryan Hollins is stupid. Literally, yeah. just like that was the caption. Yeah, like like and literally after game one. Nothing. Oh, you're Crickets. never gonna. Yeah, if you're waiting no, for I, satisfaction, you might as well forget it. You're you not know me, that. Will. I don't. Excuse me. I did not call you Will. That's the worst thing I could have called you. I'm sorry, Rick. Um, I'm a man of integrity, bro. Like I like the competition. It's healthy. Yes. You know what I'm saying? Like I still thrive for the competition to a sense. And, but and, now, and doing live hey, TV and, and 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 debating on TV is as right? close as to competition you're, as as you're going to get in yeah. our medium. Oh yeah, it, 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 and and when somebody like, hey, good job, bro. You know what? You were right. Yeah. Like to me, the integrity means something. Sure. Like if I'm wrong on something, come back and say I was wrong. Yeah. Like hey, you know what? I didn't see Dallas blowing it up, but I told you I really like Dallas a whole lot because I love Luca. Boom. I told you before the season we broke down. I see the Pistons in the playoffs. Boom. I told you there was something about Memphis I really liked. Well. For a span, they were really likable. Mm -hmm. Like <laughs> there were certain things like that stuck through. Did I drop the ball on a couple of teams? Yeah. Was I right on Phoenix? I didn't know what the heck they were. Well, yeah. they were just really bad. <laughs> yeah. By the way, yeah. As an aside, I, I, I'm. I feel bad for Igor Kokoskov and and Joe Prunny and and that whole staff because I thought those guys, under the circumstances, did about as much as they could with where they were. Agreed. 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 You, 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 it's, dude, it's a, it's a mess over there. It's a, it, their owner, he's got to, he got to get some stuff. He he has to get his stuff together, man. But what does it say about the Lakers situation? And we'll wrap up on this. What does it say about the Lakers situation that Monty could have that job if he wanted it? And it sounds like as of right now, for what I've been told is he's had people tell him, don't step into that. That he would take the Phoenix job over the Lakers job. Think about that. Think about that. Strong to the Lakers. It's a setup. You would not have choice. But as a, if I'm a general manager, Rick, or I'm a coach, yeah. I want to go to the rebuild because now I put my stamp on the success. I didn't win with your guys. I didn't win because of him. You know what I'm saying? And you yeah. got to think this is, this is a guy who's regarded right now because he was instrumental in building up Anthony Davis. Yep. You know what I'm saying? Yep. So everybody thinks, oh, go where the star is. No, that's a setup for you to get your butt. But, uh, well, you know. Especially this fired. star. Especially this star. Because the expectations <laughs> that come along with him are oh, so yes. high. And yes. especially now, I you know, I have my greater greater doubts than I ever have that he can deliver on those. No, it is. It's trap. It's a trap for sure. All right. That does it for this episode of Buker and Holland, subsidiary of Buker and Friends, part of the United WeCast Network. Uh, keep in mind, we need about, I think, a dozen more reviews, and then we will be giving away our next bag of prizes. So uh, wherever you get your podcast, iTunes or wherever, uh, rate us just hit the number of stars you want to give us if you want to leave a comment great we always love to hear from you and then screenshot that to us at buker friends and you'll be eligible to win some prizes and we're talking about a really small pool of people like less than a hundred so your chances are very good of winning better than most if you join so please do in the meantime uh in our next podcast we will continue our conversation about the playoffs. We're going to get another look at Toronto and Philadelphia. We really haven't talked about that series at all. And I also want to get into, we should talk a little bit about if KD goes to New York, how much do they need? What, what, what are his chances in New York? We see him playing the way he's playing. How much more would they need for them to be 
a factor in the Eastern Conference. We'll get into both of those in our next podcast. In the meantime, as always, thanks for listening.